you will hear a student phoning to inquire about a car for sale. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. Hello, can I speak to... Uh, the advert doesn't give a name. Well, the name is Bob, and I guess this call is about the car I'm selling, right? Yes, my name's Francis, and I'm definitely interested. You'll like my car then. Clean, neat, nice. What sort is it? Oh, the original model was called an Echo. You know, like the Echo a sound can make. But then they changed the name to Yaris, just before I bought it. Yaris. I don't know why. I liked the old name, and it's the same car, but that's what it's called. So, what's the colour? The ad says it's cream-coloured. Like cream, then? Yeah, well, it, it's more of a yellow colour, actually. Not cream? No, I don't know why I said that. It's like a canary, and small like one, too. So, what about the power? How many cylinders does it have? Four or six? My brother has a six-cylinder car and says it's very powerful. Well, this one's four only, but I find it fine for city driving. As long as you don't intend to drive this car interstate or across the country, it does the job fine. That's OK. I just want the car basically for commuting to work and maybe some weekend trips. Is it two-door or four-door? I suppose it's not four-door. The car's too small for that, right? Right. Just two doors, as you say. The front seat bends forward to allow entry into the rear. That's fine by me. This car is just for my girlfriend and I anyway. Uh, what about accessories? Radio, CD player, anything else? Does it have an air conditioner? Well, no, it doesn't, but I don't find that a problem. I just open the window. I mean, if you really want, you can pay to have an AC installed. Basically, the only additional feature this car has is a radio, but it's still a great deal. That depends on the price. You say you want $12,800, right? Yep, about that. Well, obviously you expect the price to be reduced to an even figure, right? Well, I don't know. $12,000. 12500 maybe. If you can lower it a bit, I'll come and have a look, OK? OK, OK. Let's say $12,400. But I won't lower it any more than that. Certainly not to $12,000. Well, if I can get that better price, I may come over this afternoon. But what year is this car? How old is it? My brother's got a 12-year-old car and it's showing problems. Well, my car was brand new only three years ago, but it still looks like it's only been one year on the road. OK, that sounds good. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. Can I just ask a few more general questions about this car you're selling? Sure. Can you just tell me why you think it's such a good deal? Of course, I won't necessarily believe you, but just tell me what you think. You can believe me. I honestly think this is a nice car, well worth buying at the price I'm asking. How much rego registration does it have left? Oh, uh, to be honest, not so much. But I think having lots of registration is irrelevant. It's the car you're paying for, the quality and advantages of the engine itself. Well, what about that then? 
Okay, many people like to accelerate down the freeways, right? There are a lot of speed demons out there who think quickness is all that matters, but basically, people are mostly trapped in city traffic. So one of the things I like is that because this car is small, you can put it anywhere. Say you're in the city wanting to duck into a shop. Well, you can fit this car in any little space while you go shopping or do other things, and that saves you a lot of time. Yeah, but it's not that powerful, right? Oh, sure. The feel of a smoothly purring six-cylinder engine attracts many people. But I compare my car to those small football players with the tight turning circles, those who can run rings around the larger players. This car is like that. It can turn this way and that way, dodge here, duck in there, sneak around corners, squeeze ahead, and grab a position. That's also very useful when travelling in city traffic. Okay, I'll think about it. Sure, think about it. But all these advantages are sound and appeal to other buyers as well. No one holds the same car forever, so you can say exactly the same things that I just said when you want to sell the car. That will make it very easy for you to pass this car on to the next buyer. Yeah, maybe you're right. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear an accommodation officer telling students about different halls of residence. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 11 to 15. Good afternoon, and welcome to Stanton University. I'm here to tell you about the various halls of residence we have available, should you choose to come here. We aim to offer accommodation in halls to all first-year students, and you'll find there's a good variety to choose from. First of all, there's Brown Hall, which, as you'll see, is not the most modern of buildings, but it is very popular with some students. It's got a good sense of community, some nice refurbished kitchens, and unlike the other halls, it has recently had a gym built in its basement. Another option is Blake Residence, which is built like a large house, and so everybody cooks and eats together. It has its own sectioned-off bit of private garden, and is even more peaceful because this is an all-girls residence. Although, of course, boys are allowed to visit the hall, and, uh, I understand, frequently take part in cooking dinner. The largest hall we have is Queen's Building, and this has been upgraded recently. The original parking area has been built on so that the hall now has a large common room, and each bedroom now has its own shower room, which many students regard as a real bonus. A further option is the Parkway Flats, which won an award for design in its day. And this building now has a preservation order on it. This has meant that only a limited amount could be done to upgrade it, and the surrounding area is important, so parking is not permitted around the flats. 
However, the flats do have many extra facilities, such as a special computer room, a small library, and a self-service restaurant. The cost of breakfast, lunch, and dinner is covered in the fees for this hall, so it does look a bit more expensive. The last residence we can offer you is Temple Rise, which again is slightly more expensive than other halls as the rooms are larger. This has got very lovely views across to the coast, and this more than compensates for the fact that bathrooms here are shared between six students. However, the hall has domestic staff who clean the rooms once a week, so this is perhaps an attractive option for the messier amongst you. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 16 to 20. Now, if I can just show on this wall map here where they all are, uh, you might like to go and have a look round. If you come into the main university entrance, at the first junction, you'll find that Brown Hall is on the corner opposite the theatre. So you're nice and near the station here, though I think it can get a bit noisy with traffic. The same applies to Blake Residence, which is directly facing the junction to the university entrance. These halls are often used by medical students and such like, as they're out all day, so don't notice the noise. Anyway, if you then walk along Campus Road towards the main circle, you'll see the library on the corner, and Queen's Building is just past that as you head north. You will find that it is quieter here, and you may get fewer visitors. By the way, the circle is quite a feature of the campus, as it's set into the hills and has a brand new sports centre in the middle. It's worth going to look around it. Now, the Parkway Flats are on the opposite corner to the library, facing the circle, as you head towards the main buildings. The main buildings are only about a five-minute walk from here, and places in these halls go quickly, so my advice is to reserve your place as soon as possible. Then, Temple Rise is inside the circle, next to the sports center, but further from the main university buildings. Now, if you'd like to go off and physically... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation about tea between an expert and a reporter. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 21 to 24. Hi Jacob, thank you so much for coming along today. 
It's my pleasure. I'm very intrigued about what a tea meditation entails exactly. Well, it's very simple, really. I think the first thing you need to keep in mind is that it is mostly about leaving everything that you have been thinking or worrying about today to one side. Really focus on the present moment. Oh, it sounds great. I certainly don't know very much about tea and I'm keen to get started. But before you go into more detail, can I ask you what your favourite kind of tea is? Well, I think the kind of tea we are going to have today is my favourite. It is pu'er tea from Yunnan province in southern China. What makes this tea special? Pu'er is a dark tea. The regions of Yunnan, the north of Vietnam and Laos, have one of the best climates for growing tea in the world. Pu'er is a post-fermented tea. Oh, uh, what is a post-fermented tea exactly? It is a tea that has undergone a period of ageing in the open air. They age the tea for days, even years. The exposure to humidity and oxygen help to oxidise the tea leaves and encourage fermentation. This changes the smell of the tea and also removes a lot of bitterness from the taste. It sounds similar to the process of ageing wine. The process is different, but the effect of ageing on the taste is certainly similar. Does this mean the tea can be quite expensive? Absolutely. It can be very expensive. The tea is usually pressed into balls or cakes and sold. At one time, only tea enthusiasts cared about buying these cakes, but now many people have realised that they are an investment, and so buy them like they would buy gold, because the price goes up a lot over time. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. So now I want you to focus on clearing your mind of anything other than this present moment. Let go of any concerns. OK, uh, one slight problem. I will need to record our conversation and I will need to take notes for the article. Uh, I plan to write about this for my newspaper. Uh, is that OK? Oh yes, of course. Whatever you need. Thank you. I'll try to keep my notes to a minimum. Good. So, where was I? Oh yes, I think very few people really appreciate the complexity and variety of tea that exists in the world. Right. Most people are maybe like me and just use tea bags. Exactly. And with a tea bag, the tea is trapped inside and cannot move around freely. You can really taste the difference drinking a brewed tea that was free to move around through all the water. So, do you ever use tea bags? Never. There are many different kinds of tea. White, yellow, black, green, oolong, matcha, herbal and many others. Each one has its own unique properties. To fully experience what each tea has to offer, you must brew it in the correct way. I also believe in only drinking tea that is picked and sorted by hand, rather than using mechanical processes. Although it takes more time, the tea made by hand is so much better that it leads to an increase in the tea's sales. But in that case, surely if there is more interest in the tea, and with the time-intensive farming process, this means there could be shortages because the demand is higher than the ability to produce it. There were shortages for a while, but then an artificial fermentation process was developed in the 1970s, which helped to speed up the fermentation times. As I mentioned, this process has an ageing effect on the taste of pu'er tea that is very similar to the effect on the taste of wine that you get from that fermentation process, though for pu'er tea today, we're talking about that artificial process. How can they do this artificially? The farmers gather the tea leaves into a big pile, then cover it with a large sheet or tarp. They spray water on the tea every now and then, and therefore fermentation happens faster. 
Usually, the tea is left for 30, 45, 60 or even 90 days still. The farmer will check the tea every few days and just by the feel of the tea, he knows whether it is ready or if it needs more time. Wow, that sounds like a fascinating process. I never realised that there was such a science behind producing tea. Well, now you are ready for the best part, the tasting of it. That sounds like a very good idea to me. So what I will do now is boil the water and we can begin our meditation. What does that entail? We need to focus on only two things. The first is your mind and body. Forget everything that you have been worrying about today. Forget about what you have to do later on or what somebody said to you earlier. Focus on your breathing and on how your body feels. If you have aches and pains, acknowledge them. Pinpoint where there is tension in your body and try to release it. Oh, yes. I can really feel tension in my shoulders. Let it go. Close your eyes if that helps. Take deep breaths in and out. Soon we will drink the tea. When you drink it, think about the taste and how it feels on your tongue. Is it easy to swallow the tea or do you need to gulp it? Can you brew the tea leaves more than once? Oh yes, you can brew some teas more than ten times. Now we will shift to noble silence, focusing only on ourselves and the tea. Enjoy. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a speaker giving a talk about some recent research about unusual life forms. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Hello everybody and welcome to the sixth of our ecology evening classes. Nice to see you all again. As you know from the programme, today I want to talk to you about some research that is pushing back the frontiers of the whole field of ecology. And this research is being carried out in the remoter regions of our planet, places where the environment is harsh and, until recently, it was thought that the conditions couldn't sustain life of any kind. But life forms are being found, and these have been grouped into what is now known as extremophiles. That is, organisms that can survive in the most extreme environments. And these discoveries may be setting a huge challenge for the scientists of the future, as you'll see in a minute. Now, the particular research I want to tell you about was carried out in Antarctica, one of the coldest and driest places on Earth. But a multinational team of researchers from the US, Canada and New Zealand recently discovered colonies of microbes in the soil there where no one thought it was possible. Interestingly enough, some of the colonies were identified as a type of fungus called Buviria bassiana, a fungus that lives on insects. 
But where are the insects in these utterly empty regions of Antarctica? The researchers concluded that this was clear evidence that these colonies were certainly not new arrivals. They might have been there for centuries, or even millennia. Possibly even since the last ice age. Can you imagine their excitement? Now, some types of microbes had previously been found living just a few millimetres under the surface of rocks. Porous, Antarctic rocks. But this was the first time that living colonies had been found surviving, um, relatively deeply in the soil itself. Several centimetres down, in fact. So, the big question is, how can these colonies survive there? Well, we know that the organisms living very near the rock's surface can still be warmed by the sun, so they can survive in their own microclimate. And this keeps them from freezing during the day. But this isn't the case for the colonies that are hidden under the soil. In their research paper, this team suggested that the very high amounts of salt in the soil might be the clue, because this is what is preventing essential water from freezing. The team found that the salt concentration increased the deeper down they went in the soil. But while they had expected the number of organisms to be fewer down there, they actually found the opposite. In soil that had as much as 3,000 parts of salt per million, Relatively high numbers of microbes were present, which seems incredible. But the point is that at those levels of salt, the temperature could drop to minus 56 degrees before frost would cause any damage to the organisms. This relationship between microbes and salt, at temperatures way below the normal freezing point of water, is a really significant breakthrough. As you all know, Life is dependent on the availability of water in liquid form, and the role of salt at very low temperatures could be the key to survival in these kinds of conditions. Now, the process at work here is called supercooling, and that's usually written as one word, but it isn't really understood as yet, so there's a lot more for researchers to work on. However, the fact that this process occurs naturally in Antarctica may suggest that it might occur in other places with similar conditions, including on our neighbouring planet, Mars. So, you can start to see the wider implications of this kind of research. In short, it appears to support the growing belief that extraterrestrial life might be able to survive the dry, cold conditions on other planets after all. Not only does this research produce evidence that life is possible there, it's also informing scientists of the locations where it might be found. So all of this might have great significance for future unmanned space missions. One specialist on Mars confirms the importance of the... That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.